Let's get it. Mike Sempervivi here with you for the next hour, talking professional wrestling and mixed martial arts, something we do every single day here on the Sports Byline Broadcasting Network. Tune in, iHeart, American Forces Radio, over-the-air affiliate SportsByline.com, Sirius XM 156, via podcast or video streaming on Twitch or on YouTube. I just want to say thank you for joining me today. If you were with us yesterday, you heard me run Brian Alvarez off the air yesterday afternoon towards the end of the show there. So I didn't need him today. Absolutely not. And then I'm thinking to myself, did I just make a big, big mistake? Did I? If Dynamite's a boring show, what are we going to talk about? What am I going to do? Am I going to have to open the phone lines? Am I going to have to fill time? And then we finished the show, and all of the news about Vince McMahon started to pour out, including the big report from the Wall Street Journal on Wednesday that said the WWE Board of Directors is investigating a secret $3 million settlement that Vince McMahon had with an employee that is now no longer there, whom which he had an affair. And believe it or not, that wasn't the only legal news of the day yesterday for Vince. Although the other one is a uh, is, is a little bit less pressing and uh, was was far more of an obvious result, and that was his negotiations with Oliver Luck to settle his XFL lawsuit that he's got, and that didn't work out well for Vince yesterday either. And we will get into both of those stories coming up here on the show. The biggest news of the day, also. AEW Dynamite last night as we close in on Forbidden Door. I thought it was a pretty good show. Had a couple hits, had a couple misses. That tends to happen when it comes to these shows. But we will get into all of that stuff and a whole lot more when we get back from break. Wrestling Observer Live. Oh, my. Back on the show. Mike Sempervivi here with you. Wrestling Observer Live. We do this show right here for an hour at a time. But if you want to try to get at us 24-7, you can try on Twitter. My handle is at Sempervivi. The timeline for this show is at F4W, or I'm sorry, at W-O-N-F4W. The broadcaster is at Sports Byline USA. And if you love pro wrestling, at Mid-Atlantic Pod. Brian Alvarez's Twitter is at Brian Alvarez. He's actually taking a couple days off to do some things with the family, at least when it relates to this show. When it comes to Wrestling Observer Radio, Figure Four Daily, and everything else he does for subscribers of the website, that will go on. As normal, there's always a chance Brian could pop back up here uh, just because of all the news that's been going on and, and taking place. He may be forced into it, whether he wants to or not. But before we get into all of that big news, one thing that many of you don't know behind the scenes is that producer Dom has been suffering with COVID. And you heard all about my adventures. You've heard about Brian's adventures with it. But producer Dom who could have just, like everybody else who seemed to go to the F4W convention and all the uh, events that took place in Las Vegas for Double or Nothing Weekend, could have just went there and got COVID, but no, wanted to skip all that and pick up his COVID at the AEW show in Los Angeles. And and, and Dom, I mean, can we blame, blame the uh, AEW show? Or, or do you know where you picked this up? Do you know who your person zero was that infected you? Dude, I have no idea. I, I, so the assumption was that it was at the AEW show just because it was indoors and we were in there for two and a half hours or whatever. But yeah, like you said, the entire reason I didn't go to the pay per view was I'm like, oh, it's Vegas. Vegas is dirty without COVID, and 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 I don't need to be around. You know, it, nobody's gonna care to wear masks or, or anything. Not even getting into any of those debates. It's just it's gonna be way too easy to get in Vegas. I, let's just and I talked to my friend. I'm like, hey, he's a huge Laker fan. He's never been to the Forum. Obviously, the Forum has all the history with the Lakers. I'm like, dude, I know you don't watch AEW, but let's let's just go to LA. Let's go to the Forum. We'll do something else. So it was either that or the Dodger game we went to the next night. Um, as a Giants fan, I'm I'm leaning more towards just blaming Dodger Stadium because it's the Dodgers. But realistically, <laughs> it was probably it was probably dynamite. Have you ever had a problem at Dodger Stadium? I know I know a, a Yankee fan who actually lives in Vegas who always talks about, man, there's always an issue for Giant fans. There's always an issue for somebody at, at Shea Ravine. Has that ever happened to you? 
All right, so two things. One, this was actually the first time I had ever been there. Um, and two, the the Dodgers weren't playing the Giants, so it, I didn't have my Giants gear on because I'm. that's just asking for a problem wearing it without the support of thousands of other Giants fans there. Um, I just had my World Baseball Classic shirt and a, uh, a Warriors hat on, so I guess I could have gotten people upset at me for that. Like, oh, no, Lakers, bro, but it, the Warriors got killed that night anyway. So, uh, no, I no no issues for me. Uh, I liked the ballpark. A lot of my friends were mad at me that I liked the ballpark. I'm like, why, why, why are you mad? Because it's the Dodgers, bro. I'm like, no, it's architecturally a very aesthetically pleasing stadium. I, I'm here for it. Just like the Forum. The Forum was cool. The Dynamite show was awesome, except I got COVID, I think. <laughs> so, you know, by the way, Chavez Ravine, I think you should shave Ravine. <laughs> Uh, that'll, that'll be uh yeah that'll be the french police that opens up inside of it but you know a lot of people every time the, the word uh or the words uh casual fan get brought up it always becomes a talking point dave will bring it up on wrestling observer radio talking to brian about something and then we get a bunch of people upset that he was talking about it's like god you know casual fans this and that how many of them really are there do we even have to worry about them all that and and you are a casual fan you are the ultimate in casual fan so as a casual fan who is not really seasoned going to a lot of different wrestling shows what did you think about your first aew show Okay, so casual fan in terms of going to shows, yes. I, I will admit that. I will admit I've I'm a regular watcher of AEW. Um so I Now I'll are you really a regular a watcher or is it just because but... oh, wait, hold on. Are you really a regular watcher or are you just doing this because your mom's got a crush on Jungle Boy? No, legitimately see my mom is a casual fan and she also it you know, very much a, a mom in that she she hates all the heels, but uh and, and when swerved through Keith Lee out of the battle royal, she her heart tore a little bit. I'm like, Mom, his name his nickname is literally <laughs> Swerve. Um but no, no, legitimately I whether I watch it Wednesday night or not is a different story, but I I, I have a series recording. I, I watch it every week by Friday and then I'll watch uh Rampage on Saturday or Friday night, depending on what I'm doing. So, no, legitimate, actual fan. Um, I had a lot of fun. It was really cool. It was it was different, obviously. I've only ever been to WWE events. I've been to maybe five or six Raws, a couple SmackDowns, uh, a couple house shows, and then the WrestleMania that was out here um, in the Bay Area. But I think excluding uh, WrestleMania, which is its own thing, I, I that was the most fun I've had at a show. The... The crowd was really into it. It was the excitement knowing it was the first um, California show. So, you know, getting the young bucks. And the show was really good itself. Um, I don't remember what you guys talked. Actually, I wasn't here. Uh, the I think, yeah, I don't know what you guys did talk about and how you thought the show was. But uh, I, I, we had a lot of fun. My friend who I went with, um, I mentioned it. I told him, hey, you want to go do this? He's like, yeah, because he's one of those friends who's down for whatever. He never watched it, so he didn't. He he enjoyed seeing some of the former WWE years. Uh, he was into it when Punk opened the show. Was into it seeing uh, Moxley. I don't remember who else uh, from when he used to watch WWE was there, but uh, he had a blast. And I I was talking with him after the show before I got sick. Um, and I'm like, yeah. So you know, now that you're a day removed, how are you feeling? And he goes. Yeah, I, I was on my phone, uh, and I went onto my Xfinity app, and yeah, I set a series recording because I now I need to know what happens. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, well, you were explaining the whole Wardlow thing to me, so I, I want to see where that goes. I'm like, okay. It's like, and after that promo, I really need to see what happens with that MJF guy. So, all in all, the show was a blast. I had a lot of fun. The matches were great. Pretty much got all the, you know, little cheesy fan things you could want. Got to sing Judas. Uh, Adam Cole kind of sort of came out. Didn't get all of his little things. Uh, Britt was there. It was it was a good time. Well, good. I'm glad you had a good time. And I'm glad that we together were able to make people in the chat so upset 
and so worried that I would not have time today to get to talking about Vincent Kennedy McMahon. So, so Dom, I, I better let you go back to your duties. I better let you go back to, to getting back in the wheel over there and, and making sure the power still comes on as you as you run inside of it like a hamster over there at Sports Byline. I, I appreciate you coming on here. And, and we, will, we will get to Vince McMahon, everybody. Don't worry. We, we got that kind of time today, okay? I promise you the story of Vince McMahon, I, I will tell it as we know it right now in full, as well as getting to an AEW review as well. But uh, there's some other, a little bit of bad news uh, taking place in WWE right now. And no, it's not the NXT ratings that we'll, we'll get to a little bit later on. And the, the young women's demographic, you know, the, the people that they're trying to draw into that show and, and letting you know what that is. But Fightful has reported that Randy Orton will have to undergo surgery for his back injury that he's dealing with. And if Wharton does need to go under undergo surgery, he'll likely be out of action for the remainder of 2022. So if that happens, you don't have Roman Reigns right now. You don't have Cody Rhodes. You don't have Brock Lesnar. How long before you call a Brock Lesnar? How long before you try to start bringing up people from NXT? Because for as tired as a lot of people say that Randy Orton is, he is a very difficult person to replace on that roster and on that TV show. He has not been on the show, WWE Raw, since May 20th. Uh, actually, it was SmackDown that was the last show that he was on where he and uh, Matt Riddle lost the tag team unification match to the Usos. You've heard Matt Riddle talk about Randy and, well, will he ever come back? Mentioned that on, on this week's Raw. So it was looking like they were going to lose him for a while, and he is now definitely... Uh, out of the picture so just a just another one against WWE and against their creative right now guess what everybody we're gonna get to Vince McMahon when we get back from break Wrestling Observer Live ah, welcome back to the show Mike Sempervivi Wrestling Observer Live you got my summer edition Red Bull here the strawberry apricot one if you've got a, a drink, you may need to open it up right now, especially if you're listening to Vince and your your name is Vince McMahon or John Laurinaitis. You better fix yourself a stiff drink, although being stiff is what seemingly has gotten you into some trouble. The Wall Street Journal reported on Wednesday the WWE's board of directors is investigating a secret $3 million settlement that Chief Executive Vince McMahon agreed to pay to a departing employee with whom he allegedly had an affair, according to documents and people familiar with the board's inquiry. The January 2022 non-disclosure agreement bars the former employee who was hired as a paralegal in 2019 from discussing her relationship with Mr. McMahon or disparaging him. The board's investigation, which began in April, has unearthed other older non-disclosure agreements involving claims by former female WWE employees of misconduct by Mr. McMahon and one of his top executives, head of talent relations, John Laurinaitis, a.k.a. Johnny Ace. The journal could not determine how many previous agreements were being scrutinized, although this morning Dave Meltzer on Wrestling Observer Radio noted that it was several. The board's outside counsel is still collecting information about the other NDAs, but has determined the payments totaled in the millions of dollars. This outside counsel is reportedly New York-based law firm Simpson, Thatcher, and Bartlett, and it is being retained by the eight members of the board who are not related to the McMahon family. All of the McMahons, Linda, Stephanie, Vince, and, of course, Paul Levesque. Uh, the inquiry is being spearheaded by former Sony Pictures Home Entertainment executive Manjeet Singh. The board's preliminary findings are that Mr. McMahon used personal funds to pay the former female employees who signed the agreements, including an allegation against Laurinaitis. The journal also added that the, quote, law firm is assessing WWE's compliance and human resources programs and company culture. 
Neither McMahon nor Laurinaitis have responded publicly, but McMahon's longtime attorney, Jerry McDevitt, said that the former paralegal had not made any claims of harassment against McMahon and that no money was paid by the company itself. Now, here's a little bit of a timeline on what has taken place so far. March 30th. This is the day that the board received the first in a series of emails from an alleged friend of the woman in question. Uh, it alleges that McMahon initially hired the woman at a salary of $100,000, but then doubled that salary to $200,000 after beginning a sexual relationship with her. It also alleges that McMahon, quote, gave her like a toy. Unquote to Laurinaitis adding, my friend was so scared she quit after Vince McMahon and lawyer Jerry paid her millions of dollars to shut up. Now, some things to break down out of that McMahon giving her like a toy to Laurinaitis. What does that mean exactly? Uh, the story says that the woman moved from the legal department in 2021 to become an assistant to Laurinaitis in talent relations. So how sinister is that phrasing from this woman? Um, does it mean she was transferred with the expectations that she would enter a relationship with Laurinaitis, who was married, by the way, to the mother of, of Nikki and Brie Bella still? Uh, does it mean that the woman was discarded unceremoniously when the relationship with McMahon was ended and that she was shifted over there to, to that part of the building did she receive a raise due to that affair? And that might be the most important thing of all, because while McMahon may have settled these cases with his own money, his relationship, if she got a raise while while being there because of this reason, it, it could be a misappropriation of funds to help pad an employee's salary for an unethical reason. And... Speaking of ethics, the journal also spoke to people who worked with the woman at WWE, with some of them noting that she had, quote, fallen on hard times before joining the company and spoke of needing extra money. She said she had a law degree but had never taken the bar exam, telling colleagues that her career got sidetracked while she tended to a sick parent. Now, a cynic could say that maybe this woman was pursuing Vince after she got hired. Maybe she needed to pay off debts. Maybe she was just looking for some sugar and she ended up finding it. And one could be cynical and say that. But that, of course, runs completely polar opposite with what we know the emails say. And it also runs against what we know of reality when it comes to these situations, these more often than not, very toxic inner office relationships, especially between a boss and a, 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 a employee. And we know the pressures and the consequences that end up happening for those in the subordinate position. So that's what a lot of speaking out was about. So if you know somebody's down on their luck and you know that person's in such a place where, you know, they could end up believing that not only their job performance, but that their sexual usefulness determines their livelihood. Like, you know, it, again, it may not, you know, your morals may be different, but if you're looking at this from a business point of view, you can certainly understand why there is going to be concern from the board. But we'll get back to the timeline here, because on then May 19th is the, the next key date. Stephanie McMahon announced that she's taking a leave of absence from her role as chief brand officer. McMahon wrote on Twitter while she was taking leave, she looked forward to returning. Brandon Thurston over at WrestleNomics reported Nick Khan would be taking over most of her duties and Dave and Brian Brian on the show has talked about her day-to-day -day duties being broken up among several people that were already there. Well, fast forward five days to May 23rd, WWE posts a job listing to fill Stephanie's position, which seemed like a complete 180 from everything that was being reported with how her duties were going to be delegated. Then we find out the weekend of June 3rd through the 6th, I'm not sure exactly what date that it came out, but the, the Business Insider article by Claire Atkinson, where she reports that Claudine Lillian, who was only hired in April of last year, was being replaced as a senior VP and the head of global sales and partnerships. 
Catherine Newman is then hired on, I believe it was the sixth, uh, to fill that position, which according to a press release, she worked for Manchester United Marketing, and now she would oversee marketing, brand, content, community relations, creative services, and photography, I think is how everything broke down. And what we can break down out of that is... Atkinson also reported that Stephanie was being replaced in her corporate roles as part of a shakeup being instigated by Vince. The story featured a quote from a company insider of Stephanie's who seemingly questioned her performance, saying, quote, we weren't seeing that growth. When somebody is moved out of a company, it's usually the result of something not working. We took stronger control of that a few months ago. And as was pointed out almost immediately, since that was a call that came from inside the house and there was no reported pushback about Stephanie's re performance or that it was better than what was being indicated from anyone, much less Vince, it started kind of coming across to people that he had stamped that as an official thought of the board and of himself. So raises the questions, why is her position being filled from the outside when it looked like it was going to be a temporary designation? You know, what was not actually working out here? How ineffective was she in the position? How does she feel about how everything went down? Much less Claudine Lillian. Uh, who knew about this case with Vince and what was being you know, given to the board? Who knew about it and when? Stephanie would certainly seem to know. So does one leak deserve another? And I'm not saying anyone in particular uh, it leaked anything, but obviously somebody spoke to the journal and it seems like a bunch of people have seemingly spoke to the journal. They've gone out and talked to several people, at least one person on the board. So hmm, a lot of people's conspiracies yesterday. You know, I asked for some wacky conspiracy theories uh, on my Twitter feed, and most of them centered around Nick Khan or, or Stephanie because, you know, palace intrigue and frankly, it's low hanging fruit. So it, it, it's easy to come up with a conspiracy as to why Stephanie or Hunter would be upset. But someone leaked that story to the journal and others have started talking about it once the journal approached them. So, you know, where the smoke came from, I don't know. June 12th, that's the day that the Wall Street Journal reports the board received a copy of Vince's NDA with the woman that paid her upfront $1 million and $2 million over a period of five years. And according to the journal, near the outset of the inquiry, lawyers for the independent directors asked WWE, Mr. McMahon, and Mr. Laurinaitis to turn over complaints or allegations about any relationships the executives may have had with company employees. In recent days, the investigation Investigators learned that other non-disclosure agreements involving allegations against Mr. McMahon and Mr. Laurinaitis. Hmm. Several. Not anywhere near a surprise, though, because the thought of Vince McMahon being a serial philanderer and adulterer, adulterer isn't really a shock. The thought of him doing it in his 70s can be a shock in, a, in another completely different way. So don't think about that. But, you know, Vince, can he survive this? Absolutely. And you know what? I think he probably will, relatively unscathed. He holds 80% of the company's voting stock. He has an incredible amount of juice amongst the other business and financial types. I think people that would look at this from the outside or in the corporate world would maybe cringe a little bit. Because in their world, nothing like this would ever fly. But when it comes to Vince's world, he seems to be able to operate in his own bubble. So we'll have to see what happens. In its regulatory findings, WWE lists the potential of a CEO leaving as risk for investors. And we know they don't like to have their money messed with. Who may not be so lucky? John Laurinaitis. But we'll have to see how that plays itself out. Bunch of other news to get into, including AEW Dynamite from last night. Wrestling Observer Live. Back on the show with you, Mike Sempervivi here, Wrestling Observer Live. The big boss man, Brian Alvarez, will be back on Tuesday, unless news is so much and so prevalent and so pressing that he... He's got a breakaway time from his family to come back here and do this show. Hopefully that is not the case. Did I answer everybody's questions about Vince? Does anybody have any questions about Vince as I pull the ultimate Brian on the air right now on national radio, speaking to people in video chats? Any of you guys, especially you and Twitch, because that's the only one I have open right now. It, it, are all the, the, the questions answered? For those of you out there going, man, they got SmackDown coming up. Are, are Vince and Johnny Ace going to travel to it? Yes. Business as usual for Vince McMahon. 
I see somebody in the the chat actually posted something about you know he's going to hire a PR firm. No, no, no crisis PR firm is needed at, at WWE. I don't think right now. Um, now then again, you get board of, guys from the board of directors, people from outside of this realm, people like again the the, the Manjeet Singh from from Sony, you know, entertainment, uh, home entertainment, the, you know, the the world that he came from. I'm sure he's got to be looking at this and just you know. You know, again, it's it, it, almost anywhere else. I think Jerry Richardson of the Carolina Panthers, you know, had to sell. We had a huge we've had we, we've had a, a lot of issues <laughs> when it comes to this, you know, again, especially in, in the, the speaking out era. But we'll have to see if any of this stuff really affects WWE in the end. Uh, somebody said Dude, big man's lawyer isn't really that good. He's just got the money to fight. No, Jerry McDevitt is very good, guys. He's very, very good. And Vince McMahon is only one of very few people. There's only a handful of people. I think there's only two that I know of. And Vince is one of them that he is going to retain as a client, even though that he's going to be retiring soon or is basically in semi-retirement right now for K&L Gates, who he works for in Pittsburgh. He's been with Vince a long time. They fought the government and won. And uh, he's gone through many, many other battles with him, the steroid trial being the biggest. And uh, we'll have to see what happens as more news comes out. If if more comes out from the board, if more comes out from the Wall Street Journal, we're, of course, going to have it here. Keep an eye on F4WOnline.com slash WrestlingObserver.com all weekend long. Dave is going to be doing shows. Jim Valley is going to be live in this chair 1 p.m. on Saturday. Andrew Zarian is going to be in this chair Sunday at 6 p.m. And then I will be back on Monday. So anything that happens and breaks when it comes to this story, we will have it all for you. But before I run out of time today, of course, I got to get to AEW Dynamite last night on TBS. Road Rager at the Chaffetz Arena, Chaffetz Arena, Chaffetz Arena, Chaffetz Arena, I believe it is, on the campus of St. Louis University. Show opened with a hair versus hair match between Chris Jericho and Ortiz. Stephen Regal was on commentary. As Tony Schiavone told us, for I don't know why, it was the 141st episode of the program. So, Play that number 50-50 today. Actually, because actually, uh, it's got double numbers in there. Trust me, as somebody who's been kind of a degenerate, play that number uh, a dollar box. Okay? Just play a dollar. Play it 50 cents twice, but but play, definitely play it box. But anyway, never mind. You should play a combo. Actually, play a combo. That's how you should really do it. 50-cent combo on that number. Uh, well, take me back to a different time in my life. But anyway... Ortiz ran down the ring, and, and then, of course, it was on when he got there. All of the Jericho Appreciation Society had surrounded the ring. Eddie Kingston was the only one down there at first for Ortiz. Uh, a battle, uh, again, a, 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 a really good way, I thought, to start the show. The, the crowd was completely amped up. Uh, Jericho got the walls of Jericho in on Ortiz, who ended up reaching the ropes. ropes. Angelo Parker pushed his hand off, which led to Kingston attacking him. And then as the entire Appreciation Society jumped on him, out came Santana, out came Wheeler Ryuta to help fight uh, all the Jericho uh, holics off of there. As Aubrey Edwards was distracted, Eddie Kingston slid in the ring, delivered a spinning back to Chris Jericho, who was completely laid out. Fans thought that was going to be it. I thought that might actually be it, but of course, no. He gets the shoulder up. Ultimately, a guy who looks just like Fuego Del Sol. He's got his gear. He's got his mask. He runs down to the ring, and he hits Ortiz in the head with a bat, which allows Jericho to get the victory. Of course, like a, a bunch of rats, the Jericho Appreciation Society bailed from the ring, and wouldn't you know it, the guy pulls off the mask, it's the Latin, it's, what was it, the sex gods, the lay sex gods, uh, Chris Jericho's partner and sex godliness. Sammy Guevara ends up joining back up with him. So that's that. And as that is going on and they're celebrating and they're feeling all good about themselves, Ortiz starts cutting off his own hair because he's a man, damn it. So he's going to live up to, to his stipulation and he's shaving his head off while mentioning blood and guts. So we are going to get a War Games uh, blow-off between these two very, very soon. Uh, then a vignette on Wardlow ran. It was Wardlow against 20 security guards, and 
they did a video that was like the people's court opening complete with the music and everything. It was great. And unfortunately, that didn't live up. The match didn't live up to that video that they did, which I thought was kind of funny. They called it a 20-on-1 class action handicap elimination match where Wardlow came to the ring first. He was surrounded by security and smart Mark Sterling. They jumped up on the ring apron. Security did. He starts pushing them off. And, and then Dasha Fuentes starts saying people are eliminated, even though they're not. Then they get into the ring, and he power bombs a bunch of them, stacks them all up. Nobody's shoulders are on the mat, but that doesn't matter because he starts pinning them three at a time, four at a time. I think he at the very end it was seven. Crowd kind of died during this, probably went too long, just needed to get in there, start killing guys, put a foot on a chest, like choke out two at the same time, drop them, that sort of thing. Because I think the longer it went on, you know, with, with people knowing that he was going to win the thing at the end, you know, it was just a matter of just, I, I think they kind of, I think they just kind of pushed it too long. Dan Lambert, then we heard the voice of Dan Lambert, uh, who had Mark, or I'm sorry, not Mark Hughes, but Matt Hughes. And Tyrone Woodley stationed at ringside. And I have not seen Matt Hughes in a long, long time. He was hit by a train in, oh my God, what was that? 2015. It was a, a terrible situation. He was obviously made public appearances after that was uh, in, 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 uh, inducted into the UFC Hall of Fame. But that was really my first time in a while seeing him and really still laboring badly on the right side. But it's amazing that that guy's still alive. Lambert wanted them to go after Wardlow, who, because he's from the Midwest too, he's from Ohio, and Hughes is from Illinois, and, and Woodley's from St. Louis, he, he kind of played to their Midwestern sensibilities and said, we're cut from the same cloth, don't take any orders from some rich prick up in a skybox, and they decided, you know what, you're right about that, and they grabbed Smart Mark Sterling, threw him to Wardlow, who laid him out, and we are getting a little bit closer to, to Wardlow and Scorpio Sky, and I know there's some people who go, ah, Wardlow should be a main eventer, he should be this, he should be that. Look, he still needs to learn how to work. Him being a dominant champion, much like Jade is, with the TNT title, getting him on TV every week, having him kill somebody, not the worst idea in the world. So, And even though that went a little long, I thought that was still a good first half hour of the show. Then it really picked up because we had a great wrestling match. Dax Harwood against IWGP United States champion Will Ospreay, who was not wearing the belt. He was actually wearing his Rev Pro Undisputed British Heavyweight Championship instead, which Excalibur had to explain and, and probably confused <laughs> Probably confused Jim Ross a little bit, but uh, a very good match between those two. Ultimately, Osprey got the win with the, the hidden blade. It's been said a zillion times. It'll be said a zillion more. Dax Harwood is excellent. Cash, Cash Wheeler, I start feeling bad for him here because all this love for Dax Harwood, like he's Bobby Eaton out there in singles matches. You got poor Cash, who's a great worker, like uh, Stan Lane or Dennis Condry, just getting forgotten about in this exchange, but... It, they're just excellent. They're excellent as a team. He's excellent as a singles. After the match was over, Aussie Open, Great O'Conn, and Jeff Cobb came out and attacked Harwood, which led to Cash Wheeler and Rapongi Vice running out. And then as everybody was brawling, Orange Cassidy's music hits. He saunters down to the ring. We get a face-off, and we get Will Ospreay against Orange Cassidy for Forbidden Door. I'm not sure how I feel about that. It's probably going to be a good match. Will Ospreay's going to get a victory that... Probably will be good for him, but a little surprised by that. I'm a little surprised by that matchup, although I'm sure they're going to work together very well. And I'm sure no matter how long this goes up until the show and then probably afterwards, there's going to be people bitching about the fact that Orange Cassidy is existing in it. But, hey, his last match was in March 6th in Orlando at the Revolution pay-per-view. Injured his shoulder in that face of the Revolution ladder match. After that, it was Moxley and Tanahashi's face-off. I'm picking nits here a little bit because Moxley's promo was good, but I thought in hindsight, with that being 2020, I think it went a little bit too long. And I think with having Chris Jericho go out there, once Moxley was done after that long promo and kind of interrupt the proceedings to set up a match that's going to be taking place at Forbidden Door with him, it, it just, even though Tanahashi was able to tell Jericho to shut up, and even though at the end he was able to stand tall and have a good face-off and look physically impressive against Moxley... Yeah, I think they should do a video package. I still think there's some education on Tanahashi that definitely needs to be done for the American fans to really let them know how big of a star this guy is, what his legacy is, and how strong he is. Jim Ross, 
could not have put him over any harder on that show, saying as soon as he saw him, he thought he was one of the top three of all time. And again, I know there's a lot of people who've heard me say it on this show who are not familiar with Japanese wrestling, but yes, Hiroshi Tanahashi was at one point that good. And as far as his legacy goes, he is an absolute all-timer and has been one of the best wrestlers in the world uh, for years and, in fact, was the best at one point. Uh, Miro defeated Ethan Page in the uh, All-Atlantic, uh, one of the All-Atlantic uh, eliminators there. So the thought of Ishii and uh, facing off against Miro, that's the good stuff right there. That, my friend, is the money. Uh, after that, Tony Storm uh, defeated Britt Baker uh, with Jamie Hayter and with Rebel. Rosa came out, Thunder Rosa came out to run off Jamie Hayter. But Tony Storm defeats Britt Baker clean as a sheet. German suplex and Storm zero. So Tony Storm... That match, a title match uh, coming up here, uh, looks like that could be uh, in the realm of possibility as well, too. Uh, Stokely Hathaway came out for an interview, said he was going to be on, or was backstage with an interview with Tony Schiavone, said he's going to be on commentary on Friday, which I'm definitely looking forward to on Rampage, and that Willow Nightingale, who came up and interrupted him, would be getting the shot against Jade in her open challenge. Hangman P uh, Page promo, Ended up being interrupted by Adam Cole, who ran him down, said this wasn't about him, uh, said this was all about the Bullet Club being all elite. Brings out Jay White, who ends up attacking Page from behind. He came through the crowd, lays Page out, cuts a promo himself, and then disappoints Adam Cole at the end of it by saying he's not going to defend it against him either. I am not looking forward to Adam Cole going back to New Japan and having a bunch of situations between he and the Bullet Club and the Elite and all of that stuff. I am done with the House of Torture and the Bullet Club and adding anything all Elite and, and the Elite into New Japan, into Faction Wars. I'm just cringing at, but that's going to be a story for a different day. Ladder match Young Bucks against Jungle Boy and Luchasaurus. What can you say? The Young Bucks in that type of situation is incredible. I don't know what the future is going to be for Luchasaurus, but we know what the future is going to be for Jungle Boy. Finally, as Brian has been predicting since the time they got these guys together, Christian finally turns on Jungle Boy at the end after helping him up after his team has lost the World Tag Team Championship in a match that he put them in. He begins to help Jungle Boy out of the ring alongside the doctor before finally just looking at him with disgust, hits him with the unprettier, cusses out his mom and his sister afterwards, and rolls out as Jungle Boy is taken away on a stretcher after the show ends. This show is going to be ending in about, oh, I don't know, six minutes or so. But I still have to come back first, so do that with me. Wrestling Observer Live. You gotta stop using Rejoiner to go over that beat. It's just fantastic. But Mike Semper, PP back, Wrestling Observer Live. You know what? I don't think I got to. Uh, at least producer Dom told me I did not during this show was Vince McMahon's other legal issue, which was uh, he and former XFL Commissioner Oliver Luck being headed to trial on July 11th after talks to settle Luck's $23.8 million breach of contract lawsuit lasted only nine minutes on Wednesday. Both pro football talks, Mike Florio and the other Atlantics, or the Athletics, the Athletics, Daniel Kaplan, Kaplan, I'm losing, you can tell it's the end of the show here, he used to work for Sports Business Journal, uh, reported that mediators met with representatives for both sides in an attempt to reach a settlement agreement, but those talks fizzled quickly. As I mentioned, the date has been set for trial on July 11th. Luck was named commissioner of the league in June of 2018. His five-year contract became effective in July of 2018. Base salary of $5 million a year. And Vince McMahon is, is claiming that he, he fired him for signing this guy by the name of Antonio Callaway, which he claims violated the league's policy of, quote, not signing players with problematic backgrounds in history, unquote. Oliver, <laughs> I love the fact that Vince was asked about this and being deposed and, and being asked if he could actually join his own football league. And apparently uh, he had to answer that. He was told that he could answer that. And he said, no, <laughs> he, he couldn't. The problem with that is, is amongst other things, Luck is claiming that there wasn't even a policy in place when they signed Callaway. So this is not looking good for Vince McMahon. And uh, looks like that money for sure he is going to be paying 
We'll see how much he pays for other possible indiscretions as the days go on. Tomorrow's a new day, and I'll be here in this chair with you, alongside producer Dom. I thank all of you for joining me today, and we shall talk to you again after a while. <laughs>